All right. Hi, guys. Hi. I'm Andrew Husak. I work uh, at Emergen. And today we're going to talk about the R model, which uh, I'm contending is a Kanban pattern for value flow and quality. Um, it's my first time at Lean Kanban Days, both as a participant and a speaker. And uh, so thank you very much for having me. I've been made feel welcome, and the sessions have been excellent so far. Hopefully, you'll find this one useful as well. Um, so deconstructing the title a little bit, we're going to talk about three things. Uh, first of all, about value flow quality, principles, and outcomes. Uh, and then we're going to look at two different aspects of the R model. First, a little bit of a derivation of it, uh, for lack of a better word, and then what it, it might mean to you. So out of curiosity, um, how many graduates of the BCS Agile Practitioner Certification do we have in the room? A spattery. <laughs> um, that certification is based on value flow quality. And it basically says that our customers are looking for key outcomes. They're looking for increased value, improved flow, and enhanced quality. Now, initially, they might not use those words, uh, but we think that's what they're looking for. And I'm going to show you why. Hopefully, this isn't going to raise too much contention. But products and services get better over time, right? Uh, I don't mean to sound like a South Park character. No other one that says, mm OK. <laughs> right? <laughs> Any, anybody disagree with this? Right? Over time, we have some progress. We measure performance of something along various parameters. It could be value for money. It could be technical performance. It could be anything that you measure performance with. And generally, there's progress. It's what keeps people in business. So what happens if you actually fall behind on performance? Um, if we think of performance as value, um, this particular slide can show you two different scenarios. One is <clears throat> where the darker line, the one on top, is your competition. So they're offering better stuff than you are offering. Um, and in that case, you have a value problem. The other option of interpreting the slide is to look at your potential. So the dark line might be your potential, where you could be, uh, and the red one is where you're not. Um, and given that projection, the dashed line, you're always going to be behind uh, because you start late. But there may be another thing going on. Um, you may be slow in delivery. And I'm just illustrating this as a slightly differently slanted line. Um, so this, this problem might be temporary. You may get back up to speed. Um, but the net effect is you're not delivering on performance over time as much as you could be. So again, feel free to interpret this uh, as you yourself or you against the competition. Uh, for those of you that are fans of cumulative flow diagrams, you can look at these lines as trailing edges of your CFDs, the, the stuff that gets out the door. Okay? You might also have this problem, not building the right thing or not building it right. And this is how we at Emergent um, qualify quality. Now, I've, I've shown you a fairly extreme example here where your progress literally flatlines. And this is to illustrate a scenario where you're actually spinning all your cycles, spending your time in fixing things rather than introducing new things and introducing value uh, into the market. Um, and that's a fairly severe example. Again, you might recover, but the price you pay uh, is again, either with what you could have done, so money, literally money left on the table, or what your competition could be doing in the meantime. So all three of those perspectives um, are about you constantly wanting to increase your value, improve your flow, and enhance your quality. Now, a little side note. How many here are familiar with Clayton Christensen's work, Christensen's work on the innovator's dilemma, innovator solution? 
So same graph, we're still measuring performance. Um, and we have two basic scenarios, right? Where we have established solutions in the marketplace and they evolve, they improve over time and we call those things sustaining innovations. Um, they tend to make the companies that offer these kinds of things grow and bloat. And in those kinds of scenarios, the incumbents uh, in the market nearly always win. But from time to time, you have disruption. You have disruptive innovations, which actually work at a faster pace, initially don't stack up to the performance gap, but they do over time, and they actually overtake the incumbents. And in those situations, uh, entrants nearly always win. Both lines are subject to our value flow and quality problems. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, a stylized average, right? But depending on where you are in the market, uh, you need to consider that value flow and quality all play uh, in, in these graphs. No matter what, as far as the market is concerned, progress is all around value propositions. And the same two lines that you just saw are shown here symbolically as evolutions. So we, at the top, shows us an existing value proposition that's already there and we're going to add a sustaining innovation to it and we end up with something enhanced, something better than, than what we already had there. And the other example is we, we may have a proposition uh, for the market, we're not sure. So this is where the disruption, hopefully it's a disruptive thing, but we, we're not sure, but we're going to follow that path and we're going to introduce a new value proposition in the market. So those are, um, those are two different views of value propositions. The point is, value propositions can benefit from the lens of value flow and quality. So away from the principle, so you can read increased value, improved flow and enhanced quality as principles, um, but they're also essential things you need to focus on. And the little blurbs underneath show you, at least notionally, a way to get there. So how do you increase value? You deliver it early and often. We all know that, right? Uh, from a Kanban perspective, this is about the frequency of releases, it's about batch size, um, feedback. How do you improve flow? You need to manage it. One of the key tenets of Kanban of a method. You need to manage flow end to end um, so that you can potentially deliver faster but you need to optimize it against your constraints. So there's no point in trying to fix stuff where fixing it won't make any difference. So you need to be aware of what your flow actually is. And then how do you enhance quality? Uh, you use fast feedback. You use fast feedback to discover what works, to discover what works in the market, to discover what works technology-wise within your own walls. So that's kind of the basics of value flow and quality. Clearly, the, the BCS certification allows you to delve much deeper into these topics. Um, but it's enough for us to move on to the star of the show, which is the R model. Um, and initially, let's talk about flowing ideas. Because the model itself started its life as a way to model how we make an idea, we take an idea, and we turn it into something real and something valuable. Um, and the R model is not a very imaginative name, and it's simply named that because every part of the model is a, is a word that starts with an R. Um, now, within Emergen, this is kind of um, grown and shrunk. We had, at some point, seven R's, sometimes five, sometimes four. <laughs> um, so we're just now calling it the R model, and actually, you can add R's and subtract R's as necessary. Uh, I'm going to cover these six. Um, and incidentally, the idea that we're talking about can be anything. It could be about a value proposition, which is what I'm going to talk about next, but it could be other things, as we will see shortly. And where it all starts is with a belief. Right? If you're introducing something, or if your customers are, are trying to introduce something into the market, there is positive intent. There is a belief that the thing will be valuable. You don't know yet. 
right? Until you, until you build it and test it and see. But that belief is there. And to some extent, all you can do is build it. Um, and it's up to the market forces to determine whether it will, in fact, be valuable. Right? That's part of the role of the feedback. Um, and this is where quality comes into play. But that is our belief. It's not, that's where we start, but actually, practically speaking, we need to record these ideas in some way. So ideas are initially in people's heads. They need to get out of people's heads and onto, hopefully, some form of visualization. Um, and we record them as propositions. Uh, so from a business point of view, that proposition is an, an opportunity. It's a potential uh, for delivering value somewhere. What we do next is we look at options. So we can make that opportunity real, usually in more than one way. And each of those options will have different, different parameters. Um, but these options need to be forecasted. So you have some assumptions that you're baking into your thinking and your planning. And these assumptions should be documented by way of forecast. So you can have value forecasts from which you could derive a cost of delay. These might be time sensitive, so depending on the nature of the opportunity, the curves will look different. They will be sensitive to time in a different way. Um, but you also uh, need to, at this point, ascertain whether each of your options have, has the same forecast. And chances are that they won't have the same ones. So naturally, these things will need to be sorted and prioritized in order of preference, or what you believe will work best. And sometimes, some things are going to be eliminated out of hand. So in, in this particular example, option B is a non-starter. It goes off the list. Um, but option A uh, is less feasible from our point of view than option C. So, so it goes to the top of the list. So you choose something. You choose something to go to battle with. And it is that that you actually refine into a solution. There's no point in refining all of your options to all the possible solutions at this point. You only go with the one that you think is, gonna, is gonna ac actually going to work. And once you have that solution, you can plan it. There is a myriad of techniques for doing this. <laughs> um, but ultimately, if we're talking about arriving at uh, some roadmap, perhaps a series of increments, whatever you use to plan out your solution uh, to whatever degree of detail, that's what we're talking about here. Um, but remember, we had other options. So we, we are banking on one, but it may not work. So we keep the other one in, in our back pocket in case the first one doesn't work. Um, the other one that we keep in our back pocket might have an expiry date, <laughs> um, as could the, uh, the first one to begin with. So that's the world of uh, options, real options, and that sort of stuff. Once we have a plan, we can start realizing it. We can start executing the plan. Um, now, interestingly, what we mapped out as the solution can be subject to a completely different set of rules regarding prioritization. The first part of prioritization is around market value and market dynamics. This kind of prioritization is usually driven by technology and other constraints within the organization. So you might have to develop some bits ahead of other bits. You might have to test some hypotheses ahead of others. So uh, our initial plan can now be reshuffled, um, which is I'm, I'm trying to symbolically show that to you through the, <laughs> through the various uh, different order of the numbers. Um, but it is an important point. And this priority has little to do with monetary value or market value or some kind of beneficial value. It is other kinds of value, for example, learning value or uh, risk reduction, those kinds of things. Now, when you're building your solution, um, you need to constantly check what's going on and you need to project um, when you're going to finish. Because we all know it's not certain, right? This is not about waterfall plans with fixed dates. This is the world of 
actually using our flow to give us information about how quickly we are likely to complete things um, and so on. And in fact, we need to use continuous feedback in this process. These projections are going to basically tell you when you're going to land with various things. They're based on work rates. Um, but your feedback needs to check at least three things. right? How, is, how are your projections doing against your plan? And this is because you need to maintain people's expectations and the communications open. So if you've promised something and now by doing the work, you find that you can't deliver on that promise or it's likely that you're going to slip for some reason or you've discovered some things you didn't know about. Um, your plan will need adjusting, but you will also need to communicate that uh, within your company, at least. Similarly, as you're building, you might be running some experiments with the actual users, <laughs> uh, with the actual people for whom you're, you're building this, um, and gauge how well what you're building is going to work for them uh, and how well is it going to meet your expectations of value. So that second line going to the forecast is checking whether your assumptions around the market dynamics or maybe your cost bases are holding up. And then finally, you do need to check against the value proposition itself. You know, are you still on course in, in delivering your vision? Um, are you building the right thing? So all of this is pure quality. We fast forward. When the thing is built, um, you release it. Now you may also have a plan, such as having an alpha and beta program before going live. But these are kind of, they are releases, but uh, an alpha by itself doesn't really give you value. You still have the live release in mind, and alpha is a means to an end, right? Um, so we're still talking about releasing something and making the, the proposition available so that uh, people can actually extract value from it. If all of this sounds waterfally, I apologize, it's not. You have the option of releasing the value early, but that depends on your value model. In some cases, the value model will actually require you to do if not continuous delivery, something very close to it. Um, I was listening to John Terry yesterday from Linkit discussing um, their business model and how they are actually doing continuous delivery and how continuous delivery is the foundation of their business model. They don't have any other option. So, uh, so actually, they have to do this. They have to release things that make their propositions better a little bit at a time. Uh, and they happen to have a technology that allows them to do that. Um, but that's not the case uh, all the time. Okay? Um, just for completeness, this is one of the R's that is sometimes in contention. <laughs> um, but again, depending on your business model, you might need it. If you keep old stuff around, it costs you. There is a cost to doing that. Just ask Microsoft and all the versions of Windows they support, <laughs> or, or Office. Okay? Um, so there is a reason why companies sunset products, particularly desktop ones. The web doesn't have this problem, generally. Um, but there is value in turning old stuff off. Uh, and in fact, from a, from a life cycle point of view, what you're actually doing is you're taking whatever state, whatever version of the value proposition you had, and you're replacing it with the new version of that value proposition, something better. Um, that may translate to completely turning off your old solution completely and replacing it with something, something else, or changing individual components in it. It doesn't really matter. But conceptually, what you're actually changing is what is available in the market. So there we have it. This is a flow model for valuable ideas. Um, you have the, the R's on top. The bits on the bottom are things you worry about. They, they're not quite artifacts, but they are at least stand-ins for the kinds of things that you generate. And the things on the top, um, originally, some of the pictures I had of this had 
interface style lollipops, which kind of betrays some of my heritage as an architect. <laughs> but, um, but actually, it's an interesting and useful uh, concept to think about, if, if you think of those things as, as interfaces. Because they inform you where in the process you are, where in the journey of an idea you are. So if you can say that you have a bunch of forecasts, it means that you're at least as far as reveal. Yeah? Uh, it allows you to make the choices uh, as to what goes further and what doesn't. Um, you will see in a little bit that this model can apply to multiple teams um, and multiple levels of detail. And at that point, we'd actually need a ball and socket location, location because you can connect uh, this model, uh, instances of this model to each other. But a nice little uh, stylistic view of the R model. And at this point, you're saying, oh, very nice. So what? <laughs> Why do I care? How can I use it? So we get into this idea of how this is a pattern. You'd be forgiven if you thought that the R model was a process model. It's not, despite appearances. Instead, it's a model of how you acquire knowledge. The deeper you go into it, the more you know. By the time you're ready to retire something, you only retire solutions, right? You know enough to retire it. Okay? Um, but this is effectively about the degree of maturity of the thinking around an idea. And the steps, quote unquote, you can call them steps, you can call them stages. I, I use the word steps because this looks like a bit, a bit like a ladder. <laughs> Um, these are, in effect, work objectives. This is what you're trying to accomplish at that point in time. Yeah? And what they do is they focus on, dare I say, milestones. Not your Gantt charty ones, although if you wanted to, you could represent it as a Gantt chart. <laughs> right? But these are milestones in the journey. So having forecasts, having plans, having projections are all indications of where you've been able to, to get to. But these milestones hopefully reflect the actual mechanics of delivering software and services and products in general, um, which is where the stuff from the bottom of the model comes into play. Now, the reason why this isn't the process is because these steps actually sequence a whole bunch of processes. The processes are the detail of each step. They hide there. Um, so what we have is, a, is an overarching, I don't want to call it a framework because it's not that. It's just the scaffolding for your processes. Um, and at this point, you need to be asking, well, what are the processes? And the answer is, it depends but we need to bring in Kanban. The beauty of this model is that we can track work with it without knowing anything about the detail of the process. It hides it. Uh, that doesn't mean that the process is not important, far from it, but it allows us to actually track the work and measure it. Um, so if I refer to the first presentation from yesterday where we saw the picture of, the, of Neo and the metrics, right? <laughs> Um, it's along the same lines. And we can do this because, yes, you've clocked it. We can model the R model as a Kanban system. Here it is. A um, couple of things. So the, the little green arrows that go between columns are process completion flows because each of the Rs is divided into two columns, sub-columns, in process and done. So when things are actively being worked on, they're in the in-process columns. And when they're no longer being worked on, when they're finished, you've completed all those processes, so things transition to done. Um, this allows me to also make a comment about one of my pet peeves. <laughs> and that is, 
So I apologize, but I have to vent a little bit. Um, there's a difference between in progress and in process. And the definitions you've just seen allows us to make that definition, that, that distinction very clear. When something is over here, it's in progress, right? Because it started. It hasn't gone out the board. But it may not be in process. So it may not be actually being worked on. So that's the distinction. And I, I think we're quite loose in the community in terms of using those terms. But pet peeve, so I apologize. Anyway, <laughs> the green things are process completion flows. The red things are also process completion flows, but they are exceptional ones. They are for stopping work. So if you take something so far and decide it's no, it no longer makes sense to continue, you stop it. And that's one of the nice things of the retire step. It allows you to land those things in there and you can measure stuff that way as well. Um, normally you can go into retire and then from retire and process, which is not always a, a single step, right? You can end up in retire normally through the green, green transitions, but you could also get there through the red ones. <laughs> These little things are uh, an attempt to describe pull. Um, so these are pull signals uh, and sometimes planned events. Again, I have to refer to John Terry's uh, talk, and if you haven't seen it, please see the recording because it, it was very um, informative about what you actually need to do to make some of this stuff real in terms of process. Um, what LeanKit have done internally is set up an entire set of cadences where these pull signals are all orchestrated ahead of time, so people don't have to think about it. Um, frameworks like SAFE do the same thing. Incidentally, all of the done columns here are queues, except for the very last one. Yeah? You all knew that. So now that we have a Kanban system, what do we pass through it? We have, to, uh, we have to ask that question, don't we? Because whatever we decide, this is the thing that we're going to represent our demand with. And the choice is the thing that determines what processes we need to process the thing that we're going to flow. Um, so this is, this is an important decision. And I started with value propositions, so you won't be surprised when I tell you that I think value propositions ought to be at least one type of thing that you flow through a model like this. Um, and the reason is because generally our business models or our customers' business models rely on the journey of these things to market. Um, they rely on those things delivering value. And once we make this choice, we can now concretely ask, well, what does it mean to record a value proposition? in this company, as opposed to in that company. Uh, they may not be the same thing. The techniques you use, the methods you use, uh, might be different, because the business models might be different, uh, apart from the skill level of the people, et cetera, et cetera. But you can start asking these questions and answering them. Um, and what you're trying to answer here is, what is the process? I, I'm not going to show you the process, because there is lots of possibilities. But uh, And this is kind of the, the on-the-ground practice of making this stuff real. Um, but it at least allows you, this model allows you to think about it. But the interesting thing is, for value propositions, these columns can take on significant meaning. So, each column, including the done ones, represents something. I'll go through them very quickly. Um, so when you're recording stuff in process, you're trying to identify value. What is the value? What is the opportunity? Is there one? And some things you're working on, and they might actually end up directly from there to retire, <laughs> because there is no value. There's no point in pursuing it. So there's a sifting process that goes on. Others, you say, yes, we've identified value. We think it's valuable. It goes to record done. And those are your candidates for delivery. Think of it as a sort of backlog for delivery. But there is no commitment to deliver it yet. 
And the reason there isn't is because you need to fi figure out what will it take to actually deliver that thing. And this is where you evaluate options. So you quantify effort in reveal in process. And you pick one of the options. And at that point, you can say, OK, that's what we're going to go to battle with. And you commit to deliver it. You haven't yet scheduled it. You just said, we're going to do it. OK? So that column, reveal done, is subject to prioritization in terms of scheduling. The next bit, <coughs> you actually need to probably plan your development in a bit more detail. Uh, consider the teams that are going to be working on this, the dependencies, the timing, all sorts of stuff. And that's not something you do overnight. Maybe two nights, right? <laughs> um, but it is at that point you're trying to actually have enough detail to be able to commit to delivery. This is similar to taking stuff off the product backlog onto the sprint backlog in Scrum. It's the same idea. Okay? Um, so once it's in refined on, you've committed to develop. From then on, it's easy, right? So realize and process means you're actively developing the thing. Uh, when you're finished, you finish developing. Re uh, release in process for value propositions anyway. You're actually introducing the thing into the market and that could be a prolonged process. It could involve alpha, beta that runs over months. Um, in government, it might run years. <laughs> um, okay. Once it's in release done, it's there. It's in the market. At that point, it probably sits there because you're actively supporting it. At some point, you're going to pull it and at that point, it goes over to retire. And when you assign these meanings to these columns, this Kanban actually doubles as a portfolio dashboard. Executives, managers, team members, doesn't matter who, can, can actually imagine cards in these columns, right? They can tell. How many things are we now considering to build? How many things are we actually building? How many things have we done this week? Um, the, they can have whip limits. They can have all sorts of stuff. Um, like any other Kanban. But there's one other aspect to this, and that is that the transitions, the pull signals, are also significant. And you're trying to answer certain questions. Um, <clears throat> consider them definitions of done for value proposition, or policies, whatever you, li you like. But again, I'll go through these very quickly. Right? When you're recording stuff, before you can claim success, you need to ask, do you know why you might want to do something? Is there a compelling reason why you want to bring a particular proposition to market? Um, the, the black transitions are all questions about capacity. Do you have the people lined up? And this is where some of the structure and the cadences of Kanban can help you. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of those. I'll just go through the ones that do the green transitions. So next thing you ask is, in reveal, do you know how and when to do it and for how much? Uh, these could be swags. These could be proper estimates. They could be things that you got through simulation. Any way that you can answer that question, whatever is appropriate for you, doesn't matter. But you need to know that. Um, in Refine, you actually say, do you know what you're going to do? What are you going to develop? Which systems are you going to touch? Which code bases are in play? What technologies are in play? All of those questions uh, are asked there. In Realize, simple question, are you ready to go? Are you ready to launch it? Uh, in Release, um, have you launched it? Is it available for people, whoever the people are? And then finally, when you're retiring stuff, you need to say, is it gone? Is it truly gone? Right? So is there a pattern here overall? Um, I think there are at least a couple. So. Over the top, you've heard me use these words, but really, the R model allows us to think about opportunities that present options, which means we have to pick one. Having picked one, we need to decide on the direction of the solution. Um, having done that, we can actually build the solution. And once we have the solution, we can potentially have value. Um, another way to put it is first you're looking at why, then you're looking at how, then you're looking at what, 
and then you're simply looking at the timing of introducing it when. And the thing scales. Um, I'll go out on a limb and use a, use a big word. It's fractal. <laughs> it's self-similar. Um, it repeats itself at various levels of granularity. It depends what you flow through these things. And in fact, um, it needs to, you know, it can be n levels deep. Uh, probably the practical limitation is somewhere around three or four levels max. Preferably two if you can get away with it. Um, but it does support an item, a flow item hierarchy. So, for example, what if you wanted to flow user stories through the R model? Oops. You can. So if you apply the model to user stories, the R's remain the same, but the meaning of the columns changes. So for a story, you're writing it, it goes on the backlog, you then analyze approaches, you pick an approach, through conversation, right? <laughs> Not specs. Um, you agree acceptance in refine. You then have acceptance criteria defined. You go on to coding and testing. When the thing becomes ready for acceptance, then you start accepting and demonstrating it. Um, ultimately, in release done, it means you've met the definition of done. Um, but you still need to formally indicate that you've actually now stopped work on a particular user story, hence the retire column. It doesn't have, it's not split in two in this particular case because um, stories don't retire, you don't do anything extra to retire a story, okay? Um, whereas value propositions, you might. So this is how you might apply it to user stories. Uh, just as an FYI, I've, I've, I've done this with value propositions, user stories, I've done it with change initiatives. Um, there are some type of flow items which don't apply. Uh, defects is an example. Um, rework, we could debate. <laughs> Certainly experiments can be flown this way. Um, and as you might expect, the columns would mean different things. Um, <clears throat> again, the transitions are meaningful. And in this case, whereas before with value propositions, we were representing product management decisions, here, we're representing software engineering decisions. And some of these things, again, are about capacity and skill, and some of them are about um, something to do with the actual practice of user stories, right? So uh, if you see some similarity to Mr. Adzit's impact stuff, uh, it's, it's intentional, it's, it's, some of it is taken from there. So, you know, do you know the impact for the user at first? Do you know how and when to do it to actually um, implement the solution? Do you know what to code and how to test it, etc.? In the end, what we have is a multi-level meta model. Um, I'll share this with you. In one of the customers that I worked with, I actually implemented this using the R column names. So I had record, reveal, refine. And in another customer, I actually swapped it with the meanings of the columns for whatever I was flowing. The second way is much better. <laughs> so the R model can sit under the covers conceptually for your, for your benefit and for the benefit of people who like this sort of stuff. But it can be very practical and very pragmatic without even rearing its head to your customers. So you can actually introduce it uh, without using the R's at all. The thing is, you can introduce it at different levels of granularity, uh, from the portfolio all the way down to an individual task, if you wanted to. Um, and this can reflect a, product, a kind of product math and feed very happily into other kinds of views. Uh, at this point, I need to do a serious nod to Ian Carroll, because if you want ideas on how to present some of this stuff, just go to his website. <laughs> um, Stuff at the bottom, you actually would have seen yesterday in his session. Uh, so it kind of brings it together. For an individual team, they're working on small increments that are prioritized up here in the portfolio, probably along a total cost of ownership model, which is all this OPEX, CAPEX stuff at the bottom, I mean, at the top, sorry. Um, 
you know what they're going to do next, you know what's in their queue. Obviously, I only had a certain amount of real estate on the slide, but this, this could be different work item types. Um, you know when they're working on it, and you can see a very stylized view of projections here, right? So they might have, pro they're projecting and probably promised a day to deliver that particular increment, but because they might be running simulations a la Troy McGinnis, not quite as laborious as um, Patrick Stuyvert's hand simulation of Kanban in the, in the room next door. Um, but they might actually be able to say, well, there's actually a chance that we're going to deliver this thing early, a 45% chance based on our simulations. But there's also a 25% chance that we might deliver late. This allows people to act. It's a visualization. So um, is it Kanban? Not quite. Is it a combination of Kanban and other techniques? Yes. I'm sure Mr. DeVale is going to sh show you some other ways of, of visualizing work. Uh, so highly recommend that. But this stuff coincides and cohabitates with other views. And I just put out, you know, just to let you know that this represents that you're actually in the release step for that increment. Uh, over there, you're refining stuff. Um, that, that's basically the idea. Anyway, the idea of product mass and how these views work is room for a whole other talk, so that's a story for another time. In the meantime, thank you very much, and happy to take questions. <laughs> yeah? I, thought, well, I really like it. Um, I've got one question about the, uh, the early stages. How do you avoid people believing that your forecasts are but you, you even put the word limit on yeah. how do you make how, how do people believe that it's not necessarily definitely going to happen like that it all depends on the quality of what we would call your value model so uh, for a new product if you ask the marketeer or a product owner or a product manager to give you a projection as to how a new product is going to land in the market what its adoption rates are going to be and so on they will come up typically with an S-curve. Um, and they will see you know, there's going to be some early adopters, maybe 10% of our target market. Uh, and then the thing is going to steadily grow and, and so on. And they will, they will want to uh, attach some value to that based on economic projections. If that model is explicit, you can test it. Um, and if and it's made explicit not only by having the graph, so you, you can't just hand draw the thing. <laughs> um, so there's probably some uh, formulation of that S curve uh, with parameters. As long as that is that is explicit, the assumptions are explicit, and you devise tests to check all the way along, but certainly at the time that you deliver, you can keep people honest. So you might have a couple of cycles where people are trying to pull wool over your eyes and say, you know. I mean, I've worked in places where every idea was a million dollars. Right? It doesn't matter what it was, because that's what was required to get the money from the board. <laughs> right? so, so one way or another, they figured out how it was a million dollars. But you need to then check at the end, was it a million dollars? So it's a, it ought to be a self-correcting system uh, is, the, is the best way I can answer it. Yeah. It's actually quite revolutionary to, to, to consider asking, certainly, project and program management given my experience, yeah. to full value propositions and look at that all the way through to delivery, review, yeah. etc. because usually it's only there to get the original from the end. Yeah. So, you know, we'd be, you'd be tempted to think that this was end-to-end. -end. It's not quite end-to-end. -end. There's some stuff in front that has to do with strategy and vision uh, and, and corporate goals and that sort of stuff. And there's stuff at the end, well, actually, it, it, it plugs into the release bit. And that is when you're actually running the business. Um, so some of your ideas for improvements are only going to come from the field, from, from the products being used. Uh, so the end to end is not quite this, but this is certainly the execution engine um, that powers certainly product development organizations. But you're absolutely right. The, if we don't keep people honest, how is the business able to steer and correct as a whole. Uh, we all know how to do that when we, you know, when we go and build a feature and we thought it ought to work like this. We do a demo, not quite, 
we can adjust or it's completely wrong so we throw it out and replace it with something else. Those dynamics ought to apply at a much higher level to the business. Yeah? You have strategies that either work or don't. How do you know? You test. And you have to think about that ahead of time. All right, any, any more questions? No? Cool, thanks.